Pools Closed is Soul Cube's second ever game, and our second entry in the annual Australian STEM Video Game Challenge, a local Australia-wide game development competition for school students. It was also a product of two months of game dev experimentation and absolute crunch. The team consisted of four members. Myself, programmer, Monarch, the lead artist, Fucus, an artist, and Red Dane on sound design. While four members might seem like a lot, it should be looked at as a two-man project, contracting an additional two members to work during the final week of development, and that was based on the way the workload was unintentionally distributed. Most of the game's development was done by myself and Monarch, and we both heavily contributed towards the overall game design collaboratively, without an overarching creative lead. The theme for the STEM games comp was Emergence, and we integrated it through developing a tower defense game through which enemies emerge in waves. However, we did take some liberties with the genre and made something quite different to most other tower defense titles out there. Whether this was a good or a bad thing? Uh, we still don't know. Another restraint we had to work in due to the competition guidelines was that the game had to have a classification of G, or E for everyone, meaning we had to incorporate tower combat in a kid-friendly way. Our solution? Meme it. For those of you who weren't born along the dinosaurs like ourselves, let's take a geese and know your meme for a tick. Pools Closed is a catchphrase associated with a series of raids carried out by Anonymous against the online social networking site Abba Hotel, where members of the group formed human blockades to obstruct the entry points of popular hangouts with their avatars dressed in afros and business suits. We had struck game design gold. We had found the most industry-defining, absolutely thrilling, jaw-dropping setting ever discovered by man. A town pool. We got straight to work developing assets for our game following a vibrant beachy pool aesthetic. And I mean, of course we made the player character the pool's closed meme avatar. To develop run cycles for the enemies and player character, Monarch did some wizard ass crap with Blender that's going on right now. Having the pixel art character models correspond to a 3D rig helped keep all of the animations natural and proportionate in all directions. The core features we had to focus on programming can be boiled down to a few major things. Randomly generated path. To tackle this, we just ran a Bezier curve through a random selection of predefined generated waypoints that ran in rows down the map. In hindsight, we could have just randomly generated the coordinates of these waypoints, but I think we were just being veggies at the time. We used a sprite shape package to generate the visual following the curve, and the links in the description for that if you want to go check it out. The hardest part was getting enemies to follow the path once generated, and the final version still had some minor glitches regarding this issue, however most were resolved. The inability for us to figure out how to prevent towers from being placed on the path actually proved to be a blessing in disguise, as we then decided to make the towers damageable by enemies. Towers can be placed wherever you want, however if too close to an enemy's path, the enemies can stop moving south towards the pool and instead direct attention towards the towers. This added a whole new layer of depth and strategy, with towers now being able to be used as meat shields, plants vs zombie style, but also be at great risk of losing all investment put towards those towers. Bench, shop, and level system. We had to develop a system that allowed towers to move between three occupiable zones. The shop, the map, and the playground or bench. Um, and this is where we drew inspiration from auto chess games such as TFT. The gameplay loop for purchasing units is taken directly from those titles, but placed into a tower defense setting. Unlike most tower defense games, there's a cap to the amount of towers permitted on the map at a given time dictated by your current play level, which can be upgraded at the desk by paying a price that grows exponentially. The towers that appear in the shop are also dictated by your play level, with unique towers being locked to some level thresholds, and the earlier towers becoming more and more rare to appear, adding another level of consequence the player must consider when deciding to prioritize leveling up. Towers. Towers contain base stats such as HP, damage, rate of fire, range, and target priority. Target priority dictates what types of enemies in a tower's radius should be attacked. This value is a fixed value as opposed to being able to be dynamically changed in games like Balloon's Tower Defense. This allowed us to add a variety of basic stat variant towers we could develop, as well as many other mechanically unique towers such as the following. Towers that damages kids verbally by yelling at them to go faster, increases kids speed but deals high damage. Healing towers to regen other towers health, Tax Shooter-esque towers that damages in a ring shape, splash damage water bomb towers, and a bunch of others. Currency. A game's currency, red frogs, can be spent on three things. Buying workers, upgrading your level, and refreshing the shop's stock. However, there's also the option not to spend your money and gain extra bonus red frogs for holding onto your currency. This currency bonus is based on how many frogs you currently have at the end of each wave. 
You obtain red frogs through defeating kids and then dropping their lollies behind as they fade away into sobbing tear ghosts. Got to keep it G-rated, ladies and gentlemen. Controls. Unlike most tower defense games, you actually control a player character moving around the scene. However, the mouse is still utilized, as all the player position really serves to do is to provide a center for the moving field of view. In hindsight, having a player character in its current iteration doesn't really add anything to the game, and the game could have benefited from having a basic panning camera instead, RDS style. The player has two states it can choose between, order mode and inspect mode. The modes are toggled between using the scroll wheel, and the UI as well as the cursor changes to match its corresponding mode, clearly communicating to the player what mode they're currently in. In order mode, when clicking on towers, the player will either be selecting a tower to be moved, or directing a selected tower to a position on the map. In inspect mode, left clicking on a tower's hitbox will bring up the tower info menu, displaying all the tower's stats and its current level. Right clicking anywhere on the map in inspect mode will close the tower info pop up. <laughs> On that note, we'll now take a look at some actual gameplay footage of Pools Closed, alongside evaluating the project as a whole, its strengths and weaknesses, as well as things to keep in mind for future projects. The biggest flaw Pools Closed possesses is its learning curve. The complex, obscure, rule-defined nature of all the mechanics isn't intuitive enough for someone to pick up and play with little guidance. Games like TFT have a similar problem, however due to them being so popular and covered across all forms of media, that serves as a pseudo-tutorial for players. Players of complex big titles know what they're in for, and this is not the case for Pools Closed. As a completely oblivious new player, the goals and objectives aren't clear as they are not clearly communicated. This is a fault in us as developers and game designers, not the players. We attempted to develop a tutorial that loads up during the first run of the game on a new computer, however it was rushed, unintuitive, and didn't really help explain the game's mechanics, goals, and controls effectively. In fact, most players tend to get stuck on the tutorial and never progress into the real game, which is a real bummer to see, but it's a good lesson to be learned. Some key things that we found that were especially unclear to players were the Red Frog Interest Reward System, swapping between Order and Inspect modes, and what each tower actually did. In hindsight, we probably should have made the tower stats visible from the shop, however, the underlying infrastructure for how I coded the shop did not make it an easy task, so it was brushed aside. The Frog's Interest System could have been made more clear, with the UI displaying how much frogs you needed to hold until you met the next interest bonus threshold, as well as some actual assets to clearly define where the player must go to receive the bonus frogs not just a square of generic bushes. Clicking on tower hitboxes was also quite a major issue. Due to the game being in 2.5D, the hitboxes for towers must reside on where the tower actually is in the world space, thus surrounding the feet. However, this means that when trying to select a tower, its feet must be clicked, and this can 1. cause confusion for new players, and 2. be fiddly even for experienced players. There was a similar issue with hitboxes for towers in the shop, Sometimes they didn't match up 100% with the sprite shape, and clicking on a tower wouldn't register it when it appeared like it should have. These issues could have been resolved cleanly if we had chosen a traditional top-down perspective. However, our lead artist specialised in 2.5D pixel art, so we didn't want to make any drastic changes on a project we were already crunched for time on. Another miscommunication of controls comes with the level up desk, and leveling up your player. Most players couldn't draw a connection between your player level and the max tower cap. On top of that, most players also couldn't work out how to level up, or even how to activate the level up desk once located. This is because we foolishly made the controls for activating the desk needlessly complicated. Unlike every other interactable object in the game, to activate the desk, you must approach the desk in a specific zone, with the radius invisible to the player, and hit a previously unused key, E. This is the only time E is used in the entire game, and you must be standing in a specific spot to interact with something. This was a design oversight, as the level up station was implemented early on in development and wasn't changed to better suit the final product. On a more gameplay wise note, the actual randomly generated paths didn't really add anything to the game. You wouldn't even be able to tell that the paths were being randomly generated with Bezier curves, or if they were just looping through a set of predefined paths. This came down to the simple nature of the path, the fact that it only travels vertically down. 
Even though each path is different, they tend to play very similar, with little variation in how you may position your towers. Other tower defense games deal with the map variation much better, with games like Balloon Tower Defense having intricate path layouts, and games like Plants vs Zombies adding new mechanics and towers to each zone. A couple of bugs have already been addressed before, However, the most major bug that we didn't end up resolving for the final build was a bug involving the data on the tower info pop-up not displaying at all. This came about when we added animations to the board, and we foolishly sacrificed crucial functionality for pretty visuals. This only increased confusion among players about what the towers actually did, an already present issue without the bug. There was also some occasional visual bugs, but nothing too game-breaking, apart from the secret admin shortcuts we accidentally left in the game. All in all, Pools Close was a very valuable experience for the Soul Cube team, and we learnt many lessons, not just regarding technical ability, but about game design too. We're currently taking everything we've learnt from this small project and transferring it into our first major game title, with a 9 month development time goal. We've already started development and planning at the time of this video going live, so to stay up to date, make sure to subscribe and check out our socials. We also run our own community game development server, full of amazing people and even some industry professionals. It's a very community driven server with lots of events and rewards for running a healthy place for game devs to hang out and chill. So if you're interested in getting to know more about our game or just looking for fellow game developers, come say hi. Until next time, catch you later.